episode three of the Plus Science Podcast, Cracking the Obesity Code. Today, we're going to talk about telehealth obesity medication and the death of diet culture. That is definitely Kat and I's favorite topic. <laughs> so we're super excited to be able to talk about this today, a little bit about our podcast. If maybe this is the first time you're listening, our mission is really to have a lot of education and advocacy around obesity and understanding it as a chronic medical disease. We want people who maybe did not come out of TikTok, which is where our community started. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's how we got to know each other. We want you guys to know that you're not alone. We want you to know that there are treatments for your disease. You do not have to be afraid to go to your doctor and things are changing. And we also want you to be aware that it is not your fault. So that is the goal of the podcast. I'm Kim Carlos <laughs> and I have struggled with obesity pretty much the majority of my adult life, um, and also a binge eating disorder from the age of eight. Um, I am taking a GLP-1 called Ozempic, but I also have taken Sexenda, um, which is also Victoza, and we'll get into all those details at some point. Uh, and it has completely changed my life. I have lost 55 pounds, still going strong. I have completely changed my lifestyle because I now feel enabled to do so because the medication has quieted the noise that goes on in my mind where I don't constantly think about food and I'm much more in control of my choices in general. So I choose to exercise. I choose to nourish my body first. These are the things I've been able to do that I've never been able to do before. So we want to make sure you know about these things. So that's my intro. Yay. And Yay. our next person, tell us a little bit about you, uh, drive through Cat Carter. <laughs> we call this drive through Cat Carter because I'm going through some struggles <laughs> um, with my headset situation. So I wanted to come in. It's scrappy. I mean, we're right? an early on podcast. You know, it's I love it, though. This I think it makes us different. So well. Yeah. What, what if? Oh. Yes. Oh, um, okay. I think I'm okay. going to get a pair of Thank those. you, right? But I was really, uh, for our listening guest, I just put on some headphones that have cat ears. And I don't, I sorry, I'm sorry, not sorry. But I don't think anybody else I love to those. Like those. I don't want you to feel alone. I also have a cookie head. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the other microphone, you, yeah. You. The other earbuds, everything, they're just the microphone's not as good as this drive Yes. Drive through microphone. It's a great mic, Yeah. <laughs> We're fine. We just <laughs> want to know, Kat, do fries go with that shake? That is all we want to know. That's it. <laughs> right? Exactly. So tell us a little bit about you, Kat, why you're here, okay. why you're passionate about well, being on this podcast. I do always want to introduce every episode because we're all in the ATL. We're all in Atlanta. Yeah. Our, our ATLian. He hangs yes, out our with ATLian. Us. <laughs> ATLian. <laughs> so, He's our mascot. That's why he hangs out with us. He's our uh, ATLian. A little bit about myself. Uh, I'm going to make, try to make this quick and dirty, right? So sure. I'm a Midwesterner. I'm originally from Omaha, Nebraska. Nebraska. I, 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 I love doing a Midwestern accent. It's the best. But um, I call North Carolina home. I was there for about, shoot, 15, 20 years. And I've been here for, let me just not do math. I've been, I've been in Atlanta for long enough to be a resident now. But um <laughs> I have struggled with obesity all of my life. Um, as far as I can remember, at least it was something that was always pointed out to me um, from day one. Excuse me. Um, so um, I have never been small. I've always been on the, uh, I've always been a fluffy gal. Um, and honestly, like right now as an adult into my 20s, I learned to kind of Really like it. Um, but I've always been sporty. I've always been athletic. I've always loved to work out. Um, and yeah, I white knuckled and lost weight many times. Um, my first successful diet was when I was 12. Now I'd been overweight before, but at age 12, I um, decided to, in addition to basketball practices, um, I would go jogging every night and, you know, and do calisthenics and stuff. Um, it worked. Um, and I would say long story short, I, I learned, um, that was, uh, a way to get, uh, attention and love from my mother. Um, oh, yeah. so that was, but that, that's all I'm going to touch on. Cause we're, we're, it goes deep, it goes deep. So, <laughs> but, yeah. um, I, I, it became, um, became a struggle all my life, eating disorders, binging, purging, um, 
all my life, all my life. Um, and I would say maybe even like exercising is could, could have been um, exercise purging as well. Like if you do it like several workouts a day, which they encourage, but uh, it's a little mm. diet culture mm. But in any case, so adulthood, therapy, over years anonymous, everything I've learned a lot about myself. And um, but that noise, that white knuckling, that binging um, urge just would not go away. I would like an over ears anonymous. I would pray away. I'd talk to my sponsor like I'm having an urge. So it, I, I tried so hard. It was the white knuckling. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I said, let me try it again um, and start taking uh, um, taking my health seriously. And what I mean is there's a big point of shame whenever I speak, whenever you go to a doctor being obese, Um, because all they're going to do is tell you, um, well, that's how I, that's how my experience was. All they would tell you is just push away from the table, stop eating, Mm -hmm. work out. And that's another thing too. Like a lot of doctors have, have just been straight, just disrespectful to me. Like, Oh, how's working out for you? Well, jerk, I've been working out since I was eight. Okay. (laughs) Like I've been playing sports and running and everything else since I was eight. So yeah. You know where you can stick it. But in any case, <laughs> so um, I decided to like, just, hey, I am, I need to find something. And so um, I started taking Monjero, Um and it, it really did stop that, that noise, that, that need to white knuckle. Now, um, you still have to take care of yourself. You know, I still need my, as you all both know, uh, my non-negotiables are my 9 a.m. Um, spin, spin class class. Those keep me sane. Those, <laughs> I, you know, like I, it's, it's a part of my mental health. I have to yeah. go and connect. So um, it did just kind of shut off the noise. Um, I've tried Contrave, which tore up my insides like a pretzel. Um, fentramine did okay, but it did not turn off that noise. And that's funny because your, your brain is a real tricky thing (laughs) because it will tell you, Oh, um, I still want food, even though you're not hungry. Let's let's go eat a cake. Yeah. You're like, well, wait a minute. I don't have room for it. So it worked, but it, eh, this, Mm -hmm. um, Maybe we'll find out today. <laughs> yeah. It's probably just, I really believe maybe it is just the, the hormones. Like, just, we'll, we'll find out today. Yeah. But that's my story in a nutshell. Well, thank you Aww. for sharing. Thank I know you, there Kat. are people out there that have experienced similar things. And if they can hear from us and go, oh, that sounds like me. I can't even tell you how many times on TikTok, just me, just regular old me. I was honest and vulnerable and posted my stories and how many people reached out to me and told me that helped them feel not alone and yes. they could feel like it wasn't their fault. So when you say these things, know they mean something. So I just yeah. want you to know that. Our, and we have, we're get, building quite a bit of listenership very quickly. Mm-hmm. So I thank you for being vulnerable and, and sharing your story. And just so our audience knows, we are going to do this in terms of the format every week. We will have someone from our TikTok community and maybe even Discord and Facebook communities who are struggling with obesity or struggling with other diseases related to obesity come on and tell their story. And it will be unfiltered, it will be raw, and they can say what they want. So we're going to give them that moment to really talk about their truth and be able to be vulnerable and and hopefully connect with others. And then on top of that, just so you know that we are not lying, we are going to have some very intelligent medical professionals come on and be able to tell every, like basically validate everything that we're saying with facts, data, science. Those are all things that are true. These things are true. Obesity looks much different now than it did 10 years ago. Absolutely. So we hope that you will for sure come in and tune in every week to hear from our experts and to hear from people that are probably just like you. Um, speaking of other people with other things, Jernine, can you tell us a little bit about you and why what? are you here? Right? Tell me why what? you're here. Tell me what you're passionate oh about. Oh my gosh. Oh, well. Hello, everyone. I'm Janine. I am a, uh, I'm a type two diabetic and I don't like to lead with that, but that's it's okay. just, you know, what it is. And it is. I'm a little different. My experiences have been different from uh, Kim and from Kat. I 
have struggled with obesity later on in life due to my diabetes and also due to hormones and also due to an autoimmune disease. So uh, I know that there are people out there that can relate to all of our stories, but uh, I always was thin. Uh, I was like 120, 125 pounds. I was a cheerleader in high school and in college. And uh, I even, you know, was on track to being an NFL cheerleader. So it was just like, oh, okay. And all of a sudden, when I turned 30 years old, my body just flipped the script. And at the time, I didn't realize with me getting hair on my chin and like over here by my ear and just starting to gain weight, not being able to fit clothes anymore. I didn't understand what was going on. I just thought it was part of the aging process, which in a way, part of it, it was, but it was actually more than that. And I'm just so grateful that we have forums now that we're not shamed, that people with medical conditions, obesity is a medical condition. You know, diabetes is a medical condition. PCOS is a medical condition that we can talk about it and that there's treatment for us now as opposed to just eat less and exercise more. Right. There's so much more to it than that. It is so much more. So that's why I'm so uh, passionate about this podcast and changing the narrative and opening the, yeah. the conversation. Thank you. I That's awesome. That. Yeah. We're so happy to have you here for sure. Oh, I'm, I am so happy to be here. You all have just been so great. And I just thank you for, you know, Kim, thank you for creating the platform for the voices because it's going to resonate. And I always say it's like a pebble in water it's just gonna ripple let's so, hope thank you. you want a big old wave you're hey, welcome i i you. i'm so thankful that you guys are here and helping me out and we have so many people that are passionate about the same things and i'm mm-hmm. really enjoying listening and learning and uh i yep. think that it's it's a good thing you know i i let's hope good things come from it you know if we can it reach will. one person out there legitimately one yeah. person that doesn't have to die Right. One right. person that doesn't right. have to feel depressed and alone and never go see their doctor. One it, person. Yeah, it's a thing. It mattered to me. I don't know about y'all, mm-hmm. but if there's one person that, that sounds like me, I'm going to give it a shot. I, that would throw me to no end. And I'm just going to keep thinking that person's out there. You know, you know what that and being and when you get to your doctor, don't be afraid to ask for help. Yeah. We're going to talk right. a lot about that. Advocating for yourself. That's, That's right. Speaking of doctors. <laughs> we have a so excited <laughs> so without further ado here we go hi, oh, hi. <laughs> she's in first head i'm so excited <laughs> one of our most favorite doctors on tiktok that we follow she thinks of things very holistically um yes. so we have a A lot of questions for you today, and we're so glad that you came here and you're willing to help us learn and our audience learn. And before we even get started, why don't you tell us a little bit more about you and your practice and how you go about things? First of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm loving hearing this conversation. I love what you're doing. I think this is so needed. So if anybody is new to me, I'm Dr. Matea Antia. I'm a board certified internist and American Board of Obesity Medicine. And I run a telehealth clinic in Indiana and Illinois called the Rentia Metabolic Clinic. And I definitely am about using conventional medications, anti-obesity medications, but I also pair it with a lot of mindset work, coaching work, a lot of this behavioral aspect that's not done in a shaming way, but really empowers us to stop having this be, you know, the thing that this defines me and I can't move past that. But I help explain a lot of the medical aspects as well. And so I think a lot of people that end up liking to work with me, they like both aspects of that, not just one. Oh yeah, Mm -hmm. definitely. Yeah, Yeah, for sure, Kat. And I think that way too, we like that it empowers us to make changes we've always wanted to make. So we're very thankful for doctors like you. Um, and if you're all right, we'll go ahead and just start hammering some questions. Yeah. How does that sound? Yeah, love it. All right. Awesome. So, 
speaking of telehealth medicine, so obviously today we're talking about telehealth and also the death of diet culture and the way, the old ways of thinking. Um, I'd like to know a little bit more about what you think about this need for telehealth medicine practices that are specifically, you know, designed around treating obesity. This has been quite the craze, um, if, if I can say that. Um, it has. I feel like telehealth got really big during, you know, the pandemic, and now we're seeing mm-hmm. telehealth with obesity focus. So I'd like to know a little bit more about why you see a need for that and why you think that's been so popular. Yeah, this is such a good question because I do see this as well. There's just always new platforms emerging and everybody's doing well in the space. And here's what I think some of my thoughts that it breaks down to is that The obesity medicine community has been underserved always. They've not ever had a voice. They've not ever had sound medical advice where they've been taken seriously, where they've really been listened to. And so it's it's compounded on many aspects. Number one, access to that care, extremely limited. There's not enough specialists. There's not enough people that know this information that are willing to help in this area. So even if you're someone that wants to get this help, there might not be anyone in your city, in your town, even within a you know an hour or two driving. So yeah. telehealth provides the opportunity for that specialist to have greater reach, right? So number one, it's an access to care like geographically, but then I also also think it's just based on being that there's not enough specialists. So there's that access as well. So it's on multiple fronts. And I have to tell you another thing that I really see is that again, this the, this community where, where people have been struggling with weight, they've been so stigmatized and biased when they go into the doctor that there's almost like a trauma response with that. And yes. so a lot of, like, right, like a lot of my patients, and this is actually me included myself when I got help with this, I felt more comfortable accessing a telehealth platform where I could be in the comfort of my home. I could, I could maybe be in a car if I needed to fit into my life, but I felt more comfort than going in in this panic of like, they're going to get me on the scale. Yeah. And then you know when they do that like that one two they look you up and down and it's yeah. like all of that right and again I think we're getting better at that I think we're educating more but unfortunately there are just a lot of medical providers that are not up to speed as far as this being a, a chronic medical condition and how to help and how to recognize their own bias and stigma like I even had to realize this and work on it so all of that together I think the telehealth platforms are just perfectly served to help this area. Yeah. We had um, on one of our last episodes, um, a nurse practitioner, I don't know if you follow Bourbon RX, um, but he's a good time and he's real smart and sweet. And he came on and was specifically saying like when he went to school that they were just like, hey, like obesity, if you if you have obesity, you will eventually get diabetes and you will eventually have a heart attack and you need to diet and exercise it. They didn't really go into like you know, more detail on a very complicated disease. And then he really kind of had to, you know, learn a lot of that on his own and evolve on his own, you know? Mm-hmm. So, it's not, um, it's not taught. There's not the yeah. time in the curriculum because there's so much other stuff you're learning. Yeah. And also, this is actually a very new field if you think about it. Like, it's been around, I don't know, maybe 20, 25, 30 years. I'm grossly generalizing, but yeah. as far as the maturity compared to other fields, it's we haven't had as many medications, as many tools. So I feel like more people are coming into it. but Right now, if you have someone that even now, if they're coming out of medical school or any type of training, yeah. they likely haven't had this unless they went on and did additional board certifications. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Kat, I believe you had a question. I do. I do. So there's a lot of, of uh, well, a lot of information in the news and a lot of misinformation um, and around what is FDA approved. So... For example, like say Victoza versus Xenda, uh, Ozempic versus w- Wagovi. Um, could you set the record straight um, and give us like say what are the what are the differences? Um, um, is there a difference and and how like say they're marketed or packaged? Yeah, I love that you bring this up because it it is often the exact same medication. <laughs> But one, they're marketing to diabetics and one, they're marketing for weight management. So I'm going to go over each one real quick. But what's interesting is really as a medical provider, we should be able to write for any medication that we think is sound for our patient, yet Mm -hmm. weight is held to a different standard and there's roadblocks put up by insurance and things like that. So I want to go through these, but quite often in the initial study, they'll see, oh, weight was really weight came down, they kept it off long term, but they will force those companies to go through another uh, round of randomized controlled trials just to be able to use the medication 
for a different indication to get an FDA approved. So the only difference is it's going through trials, it's going through doing things like that, that gets that label that it's FDA approved. Um, so let's take, for example, the first one you talked about. So Victosa um, is the same thing as Sixenda. The generic name is liraglutide. Again, um, Victosa is used for diabetics. Sixenda is used for um, weight management. And so for if you have one diagnosis, you'll get this. If you have the other diagnosis, you'll get that. Again, usually very much so interchangeable. What they usually do, though, there's like a slight dose difference. It's like very, very minimal, right? But one might go like 0.4 higher, you know? So, so just there's slight differences like that, but it's the exact same medication, exact same side effect profile, all of that. They just went back and did testing to get it FDA approved for weight management. Same thing with Ozempic. So Ozempic came out first. Then um, we sit there and get Wagovi. Again, same generics, uh, semeglutide, but one is for diabetics and one is just for weight management. But again, you could really use it interchangeably, right? But it's an insurance right. thing where it comes down to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting. Interesting. And that that explains why it's, you know, so many different drugs and in this drug class and it's confusing because not that many right <laughs> no uh um we you know we may only have 15 you know but i had a question uh for you so last year uh as we know a new GLP class of uh, medicine came to market mount jaro which i am currently on mount jaro and uh how different is Mount Jaro from the other drugs in the GLP-1 class? And, you know, can, can you talk to us a little bit about the marketing and the savings card aspect with that? And lastly, is that the new standard for drugs that come to market? Because Mount Jaro has just like shattered almost like all the sales records of any drug ever made. Yeah, for, there's so many good wow. questions here. So if I don't address something, like, let's tell me to come back to it. Sure. Dive in. It's okay. We can yeah. Here. <laughs> okay. Let's start out with, first of all, I'm very excited about this medication. So Manjaro, again, the generic name is Terzepatide. I like to say all the names because I want everyone listening to be fully educated on, okay, this is that, and it's the same, and I know what to ask my doctor about. So you you get to marinate on all the different names. So again, Manjaro's Terzepatide. And it was it came out uh, being FDA approved for type 2 diabetics. Now, what ended up happening is we saw, oh my gosh, in the trial, they had amazing weight loss, right? So right. we saw that this 20% weight, uh, total body weight loss, which is coming close to what bariatric surgeries do. Yeah. So often bariatric mm -hmm. surgery will kind of start in this range of 25 to 30% weight loss. Again, different numbers for different procedures. But so it's rivaling what we can get done there, yet it's non-invasive in the sense that, you know, it's a sub-Q injection, but you're not having to go to the OR and get a surgery done and have all that. So number one, the percentage is amazing. How is it different than the other medicines? So mm -hmm. we, uh, like if we take uh, Saxenda or we take Wagovi, things like that, that are GLP-1s, they're just a GLP-1. Manjaro is a GLP-1 plus GIP. So I want you to think it acts in two different ways. So I like to grossly generalize, like think two different gut hormones. Again, we can use different names. I like to just keep it basic when I'm talking about it. So it sure. has more effect than just a GLP-1, right? So not only that it's doing more things, but we see a higher weight loss percentage. So with Wagovi, just GLP-1, we can see about like 15% total body weight loss with right. Manjaro over 20 so what I like to do when I have someone in front of me is look at, you know, how much weight are we trying to lose? Like roughly where are we headed? I don't set goal weights. I think that's very triggering. We don't have too. Much, right? Like we don't have control as right. to where we're getting. But if, let's say if you're, and again, like this is a whole other conversation, but if we're talking about body mass index and it's over 40, you might have a hard time getting closer to your goal without a medication like Manjaro. So yeah. um, we'll go eat all of them. They're going to do a great job, but they just not might not get you all the way there. Um, so it's very exciting. Now, what's been the problem? It wasn't FDA approved yet for weight management. That's coming. That's going to be coming soon. <laughs> right? right. They've already done the trials. So what ended up happening is months ago when they first, when it first came out, it's very standard with these drug companies. I've seen this with everything with inhalers, like you name it. They'll have a savings card to try to promote it, right? They want people to try it. They'll often give doctor's offices samples. They'll do coupon cards. Like this is not new to Manjaro. 
And so people had this card and they were getting it for 25 a month, it, you know, if they had insurance and this is amazing. Well, the cards run out, right? And that's coming up here in the coming month. And so then people are in a position where then you run up against the stigma and bias and insurance companies saying that this is aesthetic. It's not a medical condition. They're not going to cover it. And so in those scenarios, I really recommend that people work with the doctor because we have other options, even if your, um, com- even if your insurance is going to say that it's a plan exclusion, meaning they won't cover it, period. There are generic oral options and other things that we can do. So I just say really work with the medical doctor. Don't let this be the part where then all the weight comes back on. We want to okay. prevent weight cycling. Um, but it's been amazing. And I hope that that more people are going to be able to get on it here when it's FDA approved. Um, what was the other thing you asked me? Because you asked about the cards. Um, yes, and you've actually done very well. And yeah. it was just uh, uh, the last part, which was um, with the savings card and the way that Mount Jarl has been marketed. You know, we've been seeing the television commercials on yes. heavy, heavy repeat. Okay. Is is this now the new standard for especially any other GLP drug, or do you think it's the new standard of how drugs will be introduced to the market? I mean, so it's it's how they've always been introduced, but what, what's happening here is that you have a tremendous amount of the population that qualifies for this. So just to yeah. give you numbers, if we took like the U.S. population, about 40% are, are, will have the clinical diagnosis of obesity, 70% meeting overweight criteria. So again, we can get into what qualifies for a medication, but I want you to imagine if 70% of the population qualifies for something, of course, you're going to have millions and millions. It's interesting to me that I don't know why they didn't anticipate that, right? So this is something yeah. we're, we're, I mean... We can talk about drug companies all day long, but I think one of the starting places that all this conversation needs to go to is you at your workplace getting your insurance, getting your um, workplace to agree to cover medications. I think that's That's the tree that both people need to bark up Um, because it's really hard to kind of get into with with, um, drug manufacturer price, all that kind of stuff. But can your employer cover it to begin with? Then you have a lot more options. Um, but, But just the reason this has taken off so much is that there are many people that have struggled for a really long time, have not had treatment, and they finally decided, I'm going to get freaking help on this. I'm not going right. to just sit here anymore, right? We just have these tools. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. That's a great. That was, I know. Yes. Awesome. Yes. So like, rah, rah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I mean, you know, it's it definitely starts. And those have been some like organic conversations too of making sure that you go to your insurance company and to your employer and to your HR, uh, you know, uh, manager and making sure that these companies are covering these drugs because there's even now the train of thought, well, if these companies don't cover these drugs, are you working for a fat phobic company? Yeah, it's really interesting, right? So I, and this is something that I keep learning more and more about because I am in no way an expert, but I know I keep using the word stigma and bias, but the, the thin privilege that exists in our society where someone that's thin is better they are more motivated. They have this more pure lifestyle. Um, it's always better, better, better. And it's, is that necessarily the case or do you just not have a, a, a condition, right? And so yeah. there's so much to unpack there. And it's very narrow-sided because if we look at, unfortunately, again, if your weight is sort of, and, and sometimes I don't like to share these numbers because I don't want to be discouraging, but I want to empower. So if your yes. weight is sort of above a certain yeah. place, let's say BMI 40 plus, you can almost lose 15 years of your life, one five. I get chills with that. That is yeah. you losing, seeing grandkids, getting yeah. that amazing second half when you retire at 65. I want you to have those years. You are robbed of that. You're, we yeah. know there are 13, 13 kinds of cancer that occur with, you know, if sometimes if the genetic, if, you know, if the metabolic health is in the wrong place, 13 yeah. different kinds of cancer that can develop. A lot of them also, and I know we probably have men and women listening, but a lot of them, the female gynecologic cancers, uterine cancer, um, there can be breast cancer. You know, we could go on and on. So the point is this, like, there's a lot at, at play here. And often when people are not covering the medications, the employer, the insurance company, they're only looking at right now today. But can we think about 20, 30 years down the road? Because that's what I care about. I care about your whole life, not just like a year or two. Yeah, right. Absolutely. 
Awesome. It also could be like even like a, a less of a, a drain on like say medicine later on in life with these obesity related conditions. So you know, you're remember. saving the greater good. Yeah. I don't remember the exact numbers, but I remember when I went through boards, I learned about if, let's take the Medicare population, so 65 and over is typically when people will go on Medicare, that if we were able to help with weight better, we would be saving billions yearly in that population. And so ultimately, if we would treat it, we would save exponential. I mean, I'm just, I, I don't remember the exact numbers. I wish I did, but it was so- I'm sure they're vast. It was so yeah. powerful, right? Yeah, so, yeah for that, sure. Yeah. You know, that's a big push too. So this is what I, I, again, I just want to open up, like, where can everyone do advocacy work? It's to get Medicare to approve uh, covering these medications because Medicare sets the standard that a lot of other insurance companies follow. So it might feel random to you. A lot of people that are on the medications are younger, you know, maybe they're caring about fertility, like there's a lot that's going into it, but care about everyone because a lot of the time, 65 and over Medicare they're going to be the reason that other insurance companies are covering it. So there's like a lot that goes into this conversation. Yeah. At the end of the day, yeah. it's a, I, I, I think it's unfortunate that we don't just view this more as a medical condition and that right. we have equal access to care for this. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, I mean, that's for sure one of the reasons that we're doing this is it's like this conversation is so much bigger than a three-minute TikTok. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, right. <laughs> it's that's bigger amazing. than a reel. It's bigger than a short. Like, And so yeah. that's why we want people to understand that there is actually like science behind this. There is. And I, I really hope, like I, I'm, I'm a little bit of an optimist sometimes, but I really do hope that this is a way of, the, of addressing more proactive medications as opposed to always reactive, which is what I feel like our... Yeah you know, medical system does, at least here in the States, is it's always like, let's wait until you get there. And I, I had, a, there was someone on TikTok and I always forget his name, but he's fabulous. And he's type two diabetic. Um, and he doesn't struggle with obesity, but he empathizes and understands the power of these medications. And he was saying like, it's almost like you go to your doctor and you say, and they do your, they test your A1C, right? And you're like borderline. And if you had cancer and you went to your doctor, it's almost like they were saying, oh, you, you don't have enough cancer yet. Yeah. Come back when you have more mm. cancer and then we'll treat your cancer, right? Like it, yeah. you don't look at any other thing like that, but yet we're looking at like that with obesity, which we know is something that's chronic and we know it's a disease and we know it needs to be treated. So um, I think, go ahead. Yeah. I'm well, just, I was going to say, Kim, you bring up something really good, which is we know from studies, the earlier you can intervene the more likely you are to actually be able to effectively treat it and maintain it. And so I, I always say everyone, you know, if you look at it, like, I find the online community fascinating because I'm just sitting there looking at it, right? <laughs> but a lot of the time people will kind of say, oh, that person only needs to lose a few pounds and they marginalize that person. First of yeah. all, let's not marginalize anyone's experience anymore. You have no yes. idea. Like you don't know looking at people what their BMI is. You don't know their medical history. No. So my point is, Sometimes if we could realize why do things need to be at the complete extreme for us to intervene and to do things yeah. when we know sort of what things look like, why can we not have that conversation as well? So it's like yeah. everyone's story is valid. We don't need totally. to have the first. Like we just don't need yeah. that anymore. It's the saddest thing in the world when that happens. Yeah, yeah. I totally agree. I mean, I, I'll tell you even like so much of this has been a learning experience for me, but me, even sometimes I would see thin people taking an injection. What, what appeared to me is to be a thin person because my perspective of what obesity looks like is very different, right? And I would go to comment, like, what are you doing, honey? You look great. You see, you know, and then I would go, "How? I don't know shit about them. Like, I don't, I don't right. know their lives. I don't know their business. Like, what am yeah. I doing? That is not, and I wouldn't want someone to do that to me, you know? I was like, I'm going to behavior change that way too. Like, I'm not going to be going in and making hate comments or anything like that, you know? Right. Like, so, I, yeah, I, I feel the same. I think we have to quit looking at people and thinking, you know, that, um, sorry, I'm getting a virus protection thing popping up. Shut up. No, they're busy. You know, and it's very easy to do on, you know, really any social. But yeah, I completely agree. Um, I have a hot seat question for you. You ready? Let's do it. <laughs> so my question is, oh, you froze a little bit on me. Oh, oh. Okay. everybody did. Is everybody still there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're here. My virus protection. <laughs> okay. 
So um, I have a little bit of a hot seat question. I would like to know, we've seen some things, we're talking about death and diet culture today too, right? Um, about how it's very restrictive and how it just doesn't work for everybody. And for me, it was like, as soon as I would diet, I might lose 20 or 30 pounds. But at the end of the day, it always came back and then some, always, because it wasn't sustainable. The thing is, is there are certain diets out there. And one of the largest ones I would say is Weight Watchers. Been around a long time, very much, I think, tried to have a um, probably um, livable type of diet. But to me, it was still a diet. And to me, I actually have a lot of trauma around my repeat interactions with being a Weight Watchers customer, if you will. And I, with recently, we have seen that Weight Watchers has actually purchased a telehealth obesity um, med or, or, or practice, right? Mm -hmm. And we don't have to go into like details about what that is. People can Google. But mm -hmm. I, I'm so, I'll tell you where I'm what I'm afraid of. One, I want to know what you think. And two, what I'm afraid of is that diet culture, which is just, in my opinion, tanking. We're all realizing that just is not the way for the majority of the people, majority. Right. And because there's there's data for days to back that up, right? So I am concerned that they're going. It, it, I don't. I can't decide if it's, hey, we see the future, and now we're going to move that direction, you know, and so that they with Weight Watchers buying them and being able to say that their messaging is they want to be able to prescribe Ozempic, or if this is Weight Watchers coming in and this is their retirement plan, right? And you know, focusing on this and pushing their way <laughs> so well prescriptions, you know, like maybe both. Yeah. Retirement. Yeah. It, it, it's freaking me out a little because I hate to think of all of us that have gotten so much, so much care and concern and seeing something that works for once in our lives for a completely different life change, right? Being tainted by diet culture. And I have like all like feels about that so i would love to know what you think especially considering you have one <laughs> so. i will say i have not ever addressed this before because there's just so many angles on it let me let me start with this number one i agree with you we just have we just know that diets don't work so let me define that for a second for people yeah because people are like what do you mean because if i'm going on a weight loss medication again one of these anti-obesity medications you are changing things so isn't that a diet okay let's have a talk about what that means diets in the conventional sense over the past few decades have always been stick to this exact calorie number, count these exact points. He follow the, he, here's the meal plan that no matter what your yeah. taste preferences, religious, cultural, ethnic upbringing, none of it, just you're going to go ahead and follow this, right? So it's yeah. a rigid thing that has like no allowance for art if you're hungry or not, what your body's doing. It just has no relationship to that, right? So mm -hmm. I think this conversation really shows that um, the future, it's really in not ignoring that this is actually a medical condition and that there are potential treatments for it. And it just can't ignore the evidence base anymore. Like the yeah. literature exists that, I mean, I've said this number before, but like only 5% of people can lose 20% of their weight with lifestyle alone and keep it off. Most people, it's going to be about 5 to 7%. Stagger. So if you are in a larger body, which maybe many in this in the community, depending on where you're at, it's not unreasonable for you to maybe want to lose more than 5%, 10%. So I always say, take your weight, move the decimal point over, that's 10%. So if you want to lose more than that, then lifestyle alone for many people is not going to be the only way to get them there. And so what's interesting is this company has, and, I, and I, listen, I'm not here to say like, there are some people that are like diehard Weight Watchers. And if it works, yeah. Great. There are many that have come to me, pretty much everyone. And it has this. <laughs> but again, if it, if it works for you, plug your ears. This is not a comment for you. But if it doesn't, I just want you to know that these approaches where it's always like external, the recommendation, and you're never listing yourself, they don't work long term. They ignore your body's physiology. They ignore a lot of things that are going on. And I think that they probably see this. It's like, we can't ignore what's happening here. People are being helped. There is evidence. And I don't know what direction either of those companies is going to go. And I yeah. to speculate, but just in general, I think we know diet culture doesn't work long-term, no matter how much people want to believe it. They really want there to be a savior, this knight in shining armor. Like that's the thing, right? Yeah. This is what the I, again, I don't want to like ever put anyone down, but like these, when it's, oh, this is the only thing that's going to help. This is the only answer. Here's what you need to do. Just red flag. 
Because how can the same thing work for everyone? It cannot. We know that. Yeah, like, and I think that what we've learned too is that obesity is very complex. I mean, the way Kat's obesity looks is very different than mine. The way that Janine's obesity looks, especially being type two and genetically predisposed, right? It all looks so different, you know? So but yeah, different. I think it, I, I hope that is not a trend that we see, or if it is a trend, that it's a positive one and that we're steering in a better direction. Like for me, and this is just like personally going, taking this medication, I just was like, I am going, and again, I was able to, I was able to gear shift, right? Like that's what allowed my brain to do is I was able to say, I am going to nourish my body first. And if I want an Oreo, I'm going to eat an Oreo. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that has worked very well for me. You know, um, but when I was in diets after diets, I always had all of these failing feelings every time I couldn't comply every time, like whether it was a meal or a day or whatever it was. And not only that, I always felt I, I started to associate a, a very bad relationship, I would think, with with food and morality. Um, yes. I've heard people say that food doesn't have someone in our community says food doesn't have moral worth, you know, and that that was a big aha moment for me like it is just food like an inanimate object right an inanimate thing entered your mouth and now we're like i'm more or less worthy and sad yes but we've been trained our whole freaking life on that right so i want people to have compassion if they're listening they're like well that sounds great but like i don't think i'm ever going to achieve that no one here that's has worked on that or is there or has changed things like it's taken me years to work on my relationship with food where nothing's good or bad, where I like the changes I'm making. Like, it's just, it's just not overnight. If you've had yeah. like decades of indoctrination. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. 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 Like, like, you know, you can't have dessert unless you finish your dinner, you know, things yeah. like that. Mm. Don't that with it me. makes, it puts it on a pedestal. Yeah. 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 It does. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a really good point. Um, but yeah, thank you. Sorry, I kind of went off on a tangent there. I think Kat had, a, had another question. Well, that's a really quick one. Speaking of um, the GLP ones um, and obesity being a chronic illness, um, there is also that concept, uh, misconception that like once you're done, you're done. You don't have to take it anymore. Go away. Mm. Um, so <laughs> what is your perception on like say maintenance um, and also maybe even encouraging like the medical community uh, maybe even insurance that this is a lifetime sort of situation. Yeah, I'll I'll say this. Like my answers right now are going to be where we're at at the moment. I do think that the maintenance conversation is something that's really evolving right now. So I think that it's going to look different for different people. And I'll give some examples. Again, nothing here is medical advice. So again, I just want to like blanket statement, all general informational, but you go work with your medical team. But what we see from the studies is that if you straight up stop the medication, we see the weight gain slowly come back. So they, yeah. they, they we know the data. Now, that's not to say that everybody gains it back, but I, I saw a video the other day and this person's doctor said to them, well, that's only for people that didn't do lifestyle changes. That's literally not what the studies were. The whole they literally failing thing. Uh, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, you didn't look at what they, they literally. So a lot of these studies, it's unethical, actually, if you just like cut people off from the meds to not provide them any support. Like if you look at, I know I'm not a pediatrician, but if you look at the approvals that they went through, like if you look at when they design studies for kids, if you're not going to give medication to one arm, you're still going to have to give them help. Like it's, it's, it's like almost unethical yeah. that we're not going to do anything. All right. So what we see is the weight can come back. So it's reasonable to think like with any medical condition, if you had to use that on the way down, that you might need to keep using it. Now it might look different. So it might be maybe instead of every seven days, it's spaced out a little bit more. Maybe the dose comes down some, but I don't know that it's a reasonable expectation for a majority of people to then stop the medicine. Otherwise, we're in the exact same place that we were back in the day. One of the only tools we had was fentramine. It's, it's a stimulant-based weight loss medication. Yeah. And by the way, it's a great medicine in, in the right context. But yes. most states in the past, it was only approved for like a three-month period and then you had to stop it. I used to hate this medicine in training for this reason because we would like get this weight off and then three, four months later, boom, it was all right back on, right? Because we got through right. what helped yeah. them. So, most people, my talk, this is before I ever start medicine with a patient. Are you up for that? This might be a little bit of a long haul being on this because if they're not, it's not loving to start it. It's not helpful yeah. because you're going to have this rebound hunger when it goes away. And it's not that the medicine, um, oh, the, the, that's so horrible what the medicine did. No, it really worked. And now you yeah. got rid of it. And now you're feeling what life was like without it. And I don't yeah. want to do that to people. Like then that's just, 
Yeah. Yeah. Cycle. Then let's do that. Yeah, yeah, that discourse sure. going around too, like, well, you know, if you, there's that, what, that, um, there's a, a personality that's um, going around, at her circles around social saying, I was on Ozempic, but now I gained it all back because Ozempic, oh, yeah. I laid back. Yeah, like, there was the celebrity. narrative. Yeah. Oh, wait, yeah. the narrative that we need. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and if my guess is, and like, I don't know her business, but she was quite young. And, um, I mean, and I, mean, I don't know her business. I, I follow her. She's fabulous. Um, but she was quite young. And, and, and if doctors, like you said, if doctors aren't saying, you know, like, there are some things we've got to do around this, you know, or this is a long-term thing, especially if you are young, starting something like this, you know, I think it's really important to know that. And I hope, I hope doctors are trying to, to make that change and now. Do you know what I tell patients too? And this is, I think every doctor has their own philosophy. So unfortunately you need to, you're already having a hard time finding someone and now I've got another task for you. They need to be aligned with what you're wanting to do. I personally don't know that we have a cure, right? That I put you on is that you're good for life. I really think that unfortunately this is something that needs to be managed for life. And so you might be doing great for a period. Then we might need to change medication. We might need to, you might need to stop it for different reasons. Maybe bariatric surgery comes around. It's just the right tool at the right time. And so I really, I don't ever like to comment on anyone's story because again, you you can see when people gain weight, right? And value in commenting on that or having a place in that part of their life. They're going, it's just physically, you're able to see what health condition they're going through. It's just- Um, unfortunately it's for life we're gonna have to manage this that's what that's yeah. my personal view and and I don't I don't yeah. tell people it's like it's solved it's just not yeah no. yeah it's yeah. more like and that's when I think about is I know that this is likely something that I'll because I've struggled since I was eight right I know this is likely I'll be on as long as it's safe I will probably be on some form of one of these medications forever if I'm lucky enough and blessed enough to be able to do that um if it's safe <laughs> but I also know that with the advancements of science, they make hope something different that helps me yeah, lose weight when I'm at a different point. stage in my weight loss. Like, so yeah. I have decided that that is a job for future Kim, uh, oh, because, I because I, I just, that. all I could do was kind of be in the moment now and do what I can now. Now I'm going to be honest with you though. That is not the way my brain works. I used to obsess, obsess about not only food, but everything. Like I would unwind my day like in my, in the evenings of everything I did from my mannerisms to this, to that, like I w- it was all related because when my food noise went away, that went away. So now I'm at a place where I can go, yeah, do I need to worry about that? And then I'll go, is there anything I can do about it? No. Yeah. And then I'll go, okay, well then I can't. And if there is, I make a change. So it's sort of like I worry appropriately now. Um, again, back to like how these medications can be used in different ways. Um, but it, it, people have been saying this to me for years, like, like, it, well, you can't do anything about that. Don't worry. And I'm like, you have no idea. <laughs> like, I wish I could just, you know, and then it turned out I was able to regulate. I'm oversimplifying, regulate something with my gut. And all of a sudden my brain regulated, right? They do say yep. that. Yeah. yeah. That the gut is the second brain, you know, so. But it makes I, sense now. Yeah. It makes yeah. sense because I think all of us, I think I can safely say that all of us, it was not just the food noise, but it was just straight anxiety. Yes, straight. I mean, just just pure anxiety. And yeah. now, and especially with my occupation, I'm a flight attendant. So if, if we have a delay or something like that, before I went to work, I made sure that my lunchbox was packed to the gill because I yeah. wanted to make sure I had food because that's what we were taught. But I, you know, understand that. but. The anxiety piece is gone. It's like now I feel like I can live. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah it makes that sense to me. That's extreme. You but know, it's like I can enjoy my life. Like you're like <laughs> at something the next level, right? And that's yeah. what I think people think. Oh, that's like the oh, like the they think they're just going to get out of medicine. It's doing everything. You're you're then able to do the other things that you need to do when you were so preoccupied before with everything else. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And being white knuckled. But your name, we did lose visual, just, you know. Yeah. You know what? Um, I can hear you though. lost a little bit. Can you see me? I can hear you. <clears throat> we can hear oh, you well. Oh. So you know. <laughs> okay. Sorry. I can We have a magical voice. <laughs> it's okay. We keep talking. We're going to have this on audio podcast too. 
what okay. you look like. <laughs> look, look, that's what okay. you want. <laughs> well, thank you. Well, my my question to you is, uh, and we want to ask about the shortages, which has been a cause for a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress, and I dare say some trauma every month of trying to refill these medications in this uh, GLP-1 drug class. So if, do you think it's because of the media, the celebrities using it, or, you know, just people just wanting to lose 10 pounds? And if not, where is the demand coming from for this drug class? Yeah. I, first of all, I, I, I don't think that it's all people just trying to lose a few pounds. I think it's like we talked about before that just a really big percentage of the population qualify. And I feel like in the past year, it's finally just become a uh, public knowledge that this medication is available, right? It wasn't like gate kept in some little community. It started to, everyone wants to blame, you know, TikTok and big things uh, like that. But people have just become aware that there's effective treatment there. And as far as drug shortages, I mean, that's a manufacturer problem. Because if you look yeah. at, um, you know, again, I won't get into all the specifics, but certain ones, they would prioritize one medication over making another. Again, it would be the same uh, medication, but they get to choose what line they would make more or less of. And so I know there was a big debate about sort of pitting the obesity community against the diabetic community, which I think, again, yes. why are we making one thing more worthy over another? Um, yes. Because we actually Correct. have a lot of other medications for diabetic patients that we do not have in the obesity realm. So all of these are just conversations that really break down to there's been a long need that we have not that we've not been able to treat for. We are finally having some of that treatment and now everything else needs to catch up with it. Legislation, laws, insurance coverage, medication yeah. being made at a, at a high enough rate, all of that. It's like everything needs to catch up to people realizing that there's effective treatment. Yeah. Okay. It's funny how Great. fast science is, but how slow healthcare is to catch up. With yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> It's always slower. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think you had a question. I know we're yeah, close. Yeah, I can't wait to ask this question. Okay. I love following excited. you. All right. So I love that you 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 do the holistic approach. You know, emotionally, physically. Um, um, also, I have a, I ordered a book that you recommended, Chasing Cupcakes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's coming soon. I can't wait. Um, but um, sometimes people get this misconception that uh, we take these GLP ones and then hit cruise control. We're done. We don't have to do anything. Um, so can you ex expand on like what you use in your practice for sustainable weight loss and also kind of include, um, expand on that compassion pause that you uh, talk yeah. about as well? Yeah. Awesome question. First of all, oh my gosh, do people need to do work on these medications? No, all that has happened is that you feel like you can do it, but I, I have to tell you, there are people that do not respond to them at all. The eating does not change. Nothing changes. And again, I, I do suspect they're just not the right. There's a, I, I forget the number. I think it's like 5% really don't, don't respond, right? Um, but the point is, people are doing a tremendous amount of work. They're just being helped out physiologically. So they're able to, one of the things, they're able to tell what enough is. They're getting that you've had enough signaling. These are things that don't exist when you're insulin resistant, when you're leptin resistant. So people that have never struggled with obesity do not understand this concept of like, you can just eat a whole big bag of chips and, not, and like, you're, it's just like, it's like you never started, right? They do not yeah. understand that like doesn't exist. So, um, so they're doing a lot of that work. And then um, what was the second part of your question? You were asking about the compassion pause, right? So like, yeah, how, yeah, how you... So a lot of, let's say you haven't taken the medication or you are on the medicine. A lot of what we're wanting to do is develop a new relationship with food where we're stopping it enough and not full. But sometimes that can be hard to work on if you've never worked on that, right? And so one of the tools that uh, that I came up with with Carrie Williams, it's called the Compassion Pause. And I'm going to tell you real quick what it is. And it takes a long time to implement. So don't, don't think you're going to hear it and be like, and then I did it and it was good. But basically, when you notice, you know, maybe you're in the middle of a meal and you're like, I think I'm good. Like, I'm actually satisfied, but I want to keep going because it tastes good. Or it's at night. I'm not hungry. I know I'm stressed. I'm tired, but I want to go eat. So you have an urge, right? You're not physically hungry. If you're physically hungry, please go eat. But if you're not, then I like to use what's called a compassion pause. So we're going to physically pattern interrupt in some way, either leave the room or put the fork down. But like something needs to like break the circuit that like, okay, hold on. I'm going to take a second here. And part of this compassion pause is you ask yourself, what do I really need right now? Because you know you're not physically hungry, like a boiled egg, a cheese stick, things like that won't solve it. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. And what am I really hungry for? What's actually going on? And you could be like, I'm actually really tired. I'm annoyed. I'm irritated. Some of us, um, especially if you're a woman, you're resentful at the end of the day, the second load that you're carrying, that you're having to do all the housework, all those things. And food was maybe always the answer. And that's okay, by the way. You are you are always taking care of yourself in the best way that you know possible. So let's not villainize that current version of you or the previous version of you, it's its not going to lead to a yeah. great future you. So let's really love on yeah. her. Like, I know that that's like really big work, but let's, let's love yeah. her. So you, you, you physically yeah. pause. And if you can fill it up to five minutes, great. You say, what do I actually need right now? And then you try to see in the future if you can solve for that and see if you can not have that extra food to just see what happens. Now, the, th- the third part of the compassion pause, so number one, you stopped, you asked the question, what do I really need? You're pausing. Number three, you have permission. If you want to go eat that thing, go eat it. That's fine. But now you've disentangled that this is happening to me or I don't know what's going on. You, you're starting to build up that emotional resilience, that emotional strength training, and you realize, like, I don't need this food. It's an emotional eat. You're able to label it. You're able to then start to gain mastery over time of maybe I don't then go do that, but it's not restriction. It comes from a different place. Right. Right. Yeah. The compassion pause. Yeah. I love it. I love it it so much. I I do remember, I know we're going to time, but like I did have a moment like that where I was like, I don't want one of those zebra cakes because they're around for my kid, you know? And then I went, you know what? I think maybe I'm just hungry and I just am seeing that. And I like... (laughs) I don't really think I want that. And then I ate something else and I went away and I was like, but I could never make that realization before this medication, you know? Yeah. Um, So I know you, you got one minute for you guys though. (laughs) Um, Can you tell us real quick where people can find you on social, on your website, anything real quick. And I'll be sure to tag it in the notes as well. Perfect. Thank you so much. This has been such a pleasure. So you can find on all social, I'm always Matea Rentea, MD. That's M-A-T-T-H-E-A-R-E-N-T-E-A. MD that's on TikTok and Instagram. But really the best way, if you want to find out about my podcast, which is called The Obesity Guide with Matera and Tia MD, if you live in Indiana, Illinois, and you're like, okay, let me look into if your if your clinic is right for me, um, it's rentiaclinic.com. And that has the link to podcasts, the link to information, all of it. So that's usually the best place to start with me is my website. Fabulous. I'll make sure awesome. that I put that in the notes. Awesome. Thank you so much for thank joining. You so much. Thank, you so much. Thank, you. thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. you. Bye. 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 So, Janine, I still can't see you. <laughs> That's okay. We can hear you. So, okay, this is so weird. I just wanted because, you to know. <laughs> uh, yep. Yeah, uh, well, well, because while we were recording, all of a sudden, like my screen just went blank, but I could okay. still see you all. Uh, well, that's crazy, huh? That's well, we'll a little weird. <laughs> so, so, uh, this so is I a perfect example, know. right, of us just staring at and trying to figure. It out. Look like, look like, uh, I'm sorry. I don't know what happened. I wasn't even getting notifications or anything because while, cool. we're, while, while we're recording, I always yeah. place my phone on airplane mode and yeah. I turn the ringer off. So I'm sitting here like, I didn't know you all couldn't see me. I can yeah. still see me on the screen. <laughs> oh my goodness. I, I swear it's weird. Analogy. It's so cool to see like a blank screen and hear your voice. It's like magic. It's like crystal black. (laughs) Okay. Well, um, I know we're kind of at the end of time. We like to keep it at a certain clock. Um, But uh, why don't we do our classic sign offs? And if you guys have any new, maybe you have another quote or another thing you want to say, feel free to. I don't. But (laughs) no. (laughs) How about you, Kat? You know me. I love uh, Catherine Hepburn's. I mean, it's not a quote, but her like her um, philosophy pieces of sayings throughout of her, of her life, yeah. and it's always never quit, always be yourself, and don't put too much flour in your brownies. <laughs> and for those that don't know, Kat is a baker and a fabulous baker. You should see some of the stuff that she's got. Yeah. Yes. You can follow me at Loudmouth Bakes on Instagram. Yeah, there we go. Where loud are you? Loudmouth Bakes. Yeah, because I'm a loudmouth. Yeah. <laughs> That's why we're doing that. <laughs> Sometimes we gotta get loud, right? And middle child yeah, syndrome. <clears throat> and yes, so you know, you know what I always say, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Give yourself some grace. It takes time. always, always. Yes. Um, and mine is right now what it always is 
to is that if you're struggling with obesity, um, whether it's another, you know, metabolic disorder or type two diabetes or anything like that that's related, you are not alone. There is a huge community out there on social media and you are welcome. You are not alone. It is not your fault. It's not. I get upset when I say it because it's still I'm still going through it. It's not. You can get help and you can be the best you that you can be if you just go see your doctor. Okay, so we'll make sure to put resources out there that you can connect with. And of course, you can find us on social media. I am at Dinosaur Monkey Farts Kim on TikTok. <laughs> I'm just trying to her. Um, we've got the podcast on Instagram and on Facebook. So feel free to join and follow, of course, subscribe. But we've yeah. been really blessed to be able to be here today. And thank you so much for listening. Everybody thank have a great everyone. one. Bye. Bye-bye. Have a Bye. good one. Bye.